Good morning, St. Paul's. Andrew has invited me to share some thoughts about the 90th chapter of Psalms. If you've got a Bible within reach, and if you're looking for the book of Psalms, you could probably divide the Bible's total number of pages by two and land almost directly on Psalm 90. And while you're looking for Psalm 90, let me say a couple of things about the Psalms in general. The Psalms are such a wonderful prayer book because they offer very real conversations with God. With back and forth, honest dialogue, they offer God's word for us and our words for God. Real, honest words for our Creator, as well as from the living God. But be careful. If you approach the Psalms expecting simple, cute, and comforting hallmark greeting card slogans, you will soon run smack into something like Psalm 90. Douglas Webster, an American preacher and university teacher, says that the Psalms are not cut flower prayers. There is nothing falsetto or fake about them. They are earthy and rough. When we read Psalm 90 together, notice that it does not sugarcoat reality. But it reminds us, among other things, that God is eternal, our lives are very short, we are a bunch of screw-ups, but God loves us anyway. The Bible I will be reading from this morning is an English Standard Version. If you're reading on an iPad or another device, and if it makes it easier to follow along, you may also want to click on the ESV translation. Let's read Psalm 90 together, beginning at verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength, eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So, we do not have the score to know how the psalm could be accompanied with instruments. But I expect that it does not begin with Beethoven's creeping quiet cellos, nor with the sharp, immediate, and rapid pace of Mozart's violins. Instead, I sense in verse 1 the middle range, perhaps the pleasing melodic tones of Franz Schubert. I like how Psalm 90 opens with such a grateful submission to God's good goodness. The note in my Bible claims that the word Lord used here is not from the word Yahweh, used so frequently in the earliest Hebraic writings, but instead uses the title Adonai. It seems that the term Yahweh would have been perfect for this verse. The I Am of the book of Exodus, the unchanging, eternal, self-existent creator God. Now that would have opened Psalm 90 with a bang. Instead, God's name here is Adonai, that is to say, Lord, defined as Master. It is a humble acknowledgement that God is in charge of those who came before, of us here and now, and of those who will follow as well. 
And so this is one of the major points that this psalm teaches us. God is eternal. The psalmist names the longest amount of time of which he can conceive, a thousand years. And then he states that God can recall the events of a millennium, the way we remember what we did yesterday. That God was God before the mountains were here. Just north of here, if you pass through Brock and Romera townships and keep going into cottage country beyond Aurelia, your drive will increasingly reveal great rock cuttings on either side of the road. Geologist Nick Isles writes in his book about the geological wonders of our province that these rocks represent all that is left of a colossal mountain range that was here one billion years ago. The Grenville Mountains are thought to be the largest ever seen on Earth, dwarfing today's Himalayas. Mount Everest, eat your heart out. If we'd been here then, looking out our northern windows, we'd be looking at mountain peaks soaring above 30,000 feet, perhaps even 10 times the heights of reached at the iconic scenery at Banff. But nothing on earth can withstand the effects of time. Now, after years of gravity and erosion, you can walk across Huntsville's granite, one small step for man onto all that remains of that once gigantic landmark. The psalmist points to the oldest thing he can see, mountains, and he confidently teaches us that before these mountains stood here, and long after they're beaten down into rolling hills and pebbles, there was and there will be God. The first five verses of the psalm emphasize this point, that God is eternal. We'll come back to the nature of God at the end of the psalm, but let's move on to the psalmist's second point. Life is short. In contrast to our eternal God, the middle verses of Psalm 90 provide us with the uncomfortable reminder that our own lives are short. Did you want that reminder this morning? Of course not. And here it is. The book of Psalms is divided into five parts. And the fourth part of this ancient Jewish collection begins with this song for all the community to sing together about the brevity of life, that the years of our lives are approximately the equivalent of my lawn from one grass cutting to the next. Verses 5 and 6 say that we're like grass, springing up in the morning and cut down in the evening. My own English teacher tried to impress this idea upon me and my fellow teenage classmates when we studied the classic Canadian novel, Who Has Seen the Wind? I remember that the novel had a page before the first chapter that included a quote in the King James Version from Psalm 103. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. To our grade 10 minds, the temptation was to believe that adolescence would stretch infinitely on. But our English teacher's novel unit, along with Psalm 103 and our psalm this morning, teach us that every year passes a little quicker than the last, and that life is short. After verses 5 and 6, the psalmist will repeat this idea again. When Eugene Peterson rewrote this psalm for the message, he transcribed verse 10 to say, We live for 70 years or so. With luck, we might make it to 80. With luck? Who wants to bank on luck? No wonder the psalmist has us beg to the Lord, so teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. In other words, help us to pay attention to our timetabling. Help us to prioritize all that is most important with each passing day, with each passing hour. While the psalmist's lesson here may sound similar to an old 80s movie, Ferris Bueller's maxim that life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around, you could miss it. The approach here is radically different. Because life is short, Ferris decides to have as much fun as he can, to skip school, visit an art gallery, eat at a fancy restaurant, taking a Cubs game from deep in left field down the third base line. 
It is an 80s equivalent to, of a statement from Ecclesiastes. Because life is short, we should eat, drink, and be merry. However, the difference between Ferris Bueller and our psalmist is that the point here is not simply to gain our own fun and achieve our own satisfaction, but to get a heart of wisdom. The books of Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes have a lot to say about pursuing wisdom, and it repeatedly comes back to the idea of loving and respecting God, to be in awe of Adonai, our Master. As we number our days, because life is short, we must pay attention to the passing of time and respect all that God has done and is doing around us. I need to remember to, at least occasionally, put down the science fiction novel I'm reading and go outside and look at the stars, to see whether or not the constellation of Taurus along with the Pleiades are in view, or if it's the season of Leo instead. I need to remember to, at least sometimes, remove my earbuds, even if the Red Sox are playing the Yankees, so I can hear the chatter of the cedar waxwings in the ash tree. What's preventing you from making the most of your days? What's filling up your timetable and making the days, months, and years blur into each other? What is distracting you from being in awe of God's work around you? The psalmist's first point reminds us that God is eternal. And then the psalmist reminds us to be in awe of God's work because life is short. But we're often not very good at this. We're often more interested in pursuing enjoyment rather than biblical wisdom. And that brings us to the psalmist's third point, that all too often we make a mess of things. Point number three, we are a bunch of screw-ups. Like the psalmist's second point, you probably also didn't particularly want this reminder this morning, did you? Of course not. I will spend very little time on this and I'll rush through it to get to the good news at the end of the psalm. However, the harsh reality of verse 8 reminds us that all the garbage we've contemplated, that we've said and that we've done, is revealed to God. Yikes! Surely there is not one of us that gets excited about this. And yet, once again, here it is in this terrific song for the ancient Jewish community to sing together. Imagine the days after the Babylonian exile and someone saying, please turn to hymn number 90. We're going to sing the song about how we're soon going to die and return to dust and all of our sins will be on display. Oh goody, that one's my favorite. Despite the reminders all around us that life is clipping along and that before we know it, we're going to return to dust, we continue to make a mess of the short time allotted to us. And though we know we shouldn't, we blurt out a cruel reply again instead of biting our tongue. We fight with our siblings and we snap at someone we care for with words that are intended to hurt. We bow under feelings of jealousy and greed again. We cram junk into our bodies and filth into our heads again. We try to sit on a one-goal lead for the entire third period again, and we know that we shouldn't do it. But again and again, we make a mess of things. And the psalmist tells us that none of this can be hidden from God. Oh dear, all of our petty lies will be exposed. Our cruel whispering gossip will be shared. Our cheating crimes, both big and small, will be brought out into the light. Please, please tell me that there's some good news, right? Of course, of course. And it comes back to God. God is eternal. Our lives are short. We're a bunch of screw-ups. But God loves us anyway. This is the psalmist's final point. And this is why you'll be glad that you bothered to go to YouTube to attend church this morning. Despite the fact that we repeatedly make a mess of our short and comparatively insignificant lives, our Master loves us anyway. Psalm 90 opens and closes with the reminder that God has invited us to be a part of His eternal work. Verses 13 to 17 remind us that we do not have to settle 
for short and insignificant lives. But we are invited to make Him our dwelling place and to prosper in the good work that He is doing. Some of us feel like we're a part of something that has been around for a long time. Perhaps you have a well-established business. Maybe you live in an old house. Some of you are living on a homestead that stretches back for many generations. And yet, and yet, we are invited to make our home in something much more established and something that is everlasting. We are invited to dwell in the one who has been the master from before the time of the mountains. During this sermon series on Psalms, many of us at St. Paul's have been spending our summer reading about the life of David. In the book of 2 Samuel, King David very much wanted to have a temple built for God, of cedar and stone, instead of the tent where the ark was kept. Instead, God tells him in chapter 7 of a different establishment, that through David's line, a kingdom would be established forever. Well, 800 years and perhaps 43 generations later, Jesus was born in the city of David, and all of us are welcomed into his kingdom. Despite the messes we make, our Lord says, Did you knock? Come on in. Have you made a mess of the past? I'll help you clean it up. Are you worried about your sins coming into the light? Stop beating yourself up about it. I took it all to the cross. Now make your home here, and I will be your dwelling place in all generations. And then we can live and be a part of his work that prospers. Try writing this psalm out on cue cards, or another psalm if you prefer, and carry it with you so you can pray it repeatedly. Let your kids see you reading your Bible every morning, so that the generations that follow may also make their home in God. Invite your neighbors to church, or share our YouTube link with them, but maybe not until after Pastor Andrew comes back, though. Despite the fact that we're a bunch of screw-ups, actually, because we're a bunch of screw-ups, God shows us compassion, as well as his power for making things right, through his love. And that is something that we can be happy about. As Eugene Peterson rewrites verse 14 to say, Surprise us with love at daybreak. Then we'll skip and dance all the day long. Amen? Okay, let's close. And as you think about Psalm 90 as well as your week ahead, I'm going to use some of the psalmist's own words as our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let your servants see what you are best at, the ways you rule and bless your children. And let the loveliness of our Lord, our God, rest on us, confirming the work that we do. Oh yes, affirm the work that we do. Amen. Have a peaceful and a blessed week ahead, St. Paul.